Last night we had, um, downstairs, we had a thing called Spirit and Grace. Who was here last night? Awesome. That's encouraging to see that. And I've asked a couple of people, and uh, I did this at the last second, so if you feel like you've got something on your heart that the Lord did in your life last night that you'd like to come up and share, so I've asked Lily and Trish to come up and share, but if there's something that God has done in your world or your life and that you feel that you just want to give testimony to that, I want to encourage you to come on up. So I'm just throwing over to Lily. Talk about what she got out of last night. Well, it was a unusual night for me, just on a personal note, because um, I had my first uh, public cello playing episode. <laughs> and it's... <laughs> The cello, now, those of you who know me, you know that I, you know, I play music. I, I, I can play a few instruments, and I've been playing music most of my life. Cello is an instrument that I've, it, it's been on my wish list. It's been one of those things that I've wanted to do, I've thought about doing, talked about doing, dreamed about doing. I bought a cello, and it sat there in its case, and it sat there, and it sat there. Um, and the opportunity to participate in the music at Spirit of Grace it was like a catalyst for me. So on a personal level, that was a, you know, that was a big event. About the event itself, so there I am sitting in the semicircle of musicians with my cello, and I'm watching that we had quite a gathering. We had a beautiful meal. We had how many people did we have? 60 for the meal. And then the more came afterwards. So the, the, the auditorium was quite full. There was carpet spread out on the floor cushions. There was some beautiful art and decoration, just creating a, a, lots of visual interest, things to look at and reflect on the beauty. Um, there, and, and then there was the music, which is a team of people who play together regularly and it wasn't very structured. It was a space to allow the Holy Spirit full access. That, I think, is the best way to describe how spirit and grace goes. And I watched as people eagerly came forward for prayer, eagerly came forward and prayed with one another, eagerly let go of things that were... I, I heard someone sob, and I know that was the Holy Spirit ministering deep into somebody's heart. And it's... I attended this event... Um, when they held it at Parramatta Baptist a few months back and I didn't participate. I just simply attended. And that moment of the Holy Spirit ministering deep into your heart, it's real. It happens. And it, words can't be put into it. It's a very personal experience. But that's... Anyway, I think I've probably spoken enough. So, yeah, thanks, Matt. So Spirit and Grace started out of when the pastors, these Baptist pastors go away, spend a week with the Holy Spirit. So like last night was a little taste of what they do every minute of 24 hours a day for a week. So I'm really jealous, um, but um, we're, we, are, we are blessed because he gets to do this. And so one of the people in the group um, decided that, hey, let's just take this out for more people to be able to enjoy the Holy Spirit like we do. So that's where these little church gatherings came from. But it's not just Baptist churches that are attending. It's people from all different churches coming into... We had people from all different churches, all different um, core beliefs, <laughs> well, believing in God, but with different sayings in their heads, coming from different directions, trying to understand God from different directions, all in one room, sweating to death and loving it. And because the Holy Spirit was there with us. And it, it was a beautiful night where it didn't matter what age you were, it didn't matter what you looked like or where you came from or what, what you believed, if you were Calvinist or, or, I don't know, all those ist words. Um, it didn't matter because we were there with the Father God, with Jesus, and with the Holy Spirit. And when we got a chance to pray for people, one of the girls said to me, look, I know what it is, I know what it is to know Jesus. I know Jesus. I've seen him. I've felt him. I don't know what it is to have a father, God. And so I got to pray for that for her. But I think last night there was a real taste of what it was to be with our Abba 
our father, our daddy, God, to be able to be in that place, all of us, his family, together. Um, and it didn't matter how different we were. And it's not just in that place last night, because we sit in this room today different. We are each different, coming and understanding with our own pair of glasses, not these, but the things that we look through to see the world. And, and yet we have the same Father God. We have the same Jesus. We have the same Holy Spirit. And he ministered in an amazing way last night. And I can feel him here this morning. So just relax, <laughs> open up, and, and just let him minister to you in a personal way today. Uh, good morning, everyone. If you weren't there last night, you missed a treat. We, uh, we need to be so proud of our pastor, Matt. I've never seen Matt so relaxed in the introduction. The way he got up there, he's obviously done this before with the Spirit and Grace group. But I was so moved to see Matthew so open, relaxed, and his introduction was just perfect. And a couple of um, great thank yous. This gentleman over here, Claudio, is a mighty man of the Lord. He spent lots of hours yesterday with other people, but he did lots of the setting up and lots of the putting away. And we want to thank Claudio very much for that. Uh, the food, the, the meal, you missed a beautiful meal, was absolutely outstanding, prepared by a Christian chef. And then uh, there are a lot more people came to the actual uh, session at seven o'clock. It was filling up really quick. The auditorium looked beautiful down there. You've seen the music in the middle there, so everyone could gather around. It was really great. The only problem I had, I sat near the door. I had to leave early, but I was bitten by mosquitoes a lot. But apart from that, no, the, the atmosphere, the feeling was, was terrific and up until the time I moved. But I would really encourage you to try and get involved in the next one. But Haberfield, as usual, the tradition and the support, the love of all the people here, we put on a great night, thanks to our leader, Matt. Haberfield put on a great night last night, up to the top standard. And it was really, really good, and I was really proud to be there and really enjoyed the time and the opportunity to open up and let the Holy Spirit work. Um, don't have too much more to add, but uh, I think, I think um, Lily, Trish, Colin have uh, summed up things quite well, except maybe um, a thought that I, well, a couple of guys I was talking to last night had, and we sort of had this, it was interesting because we, we, the two of us had the same idea as we were worshipping, and then we came together and prayed, and what it was was, hey, this is a, it's a really vivid picture of what heaven would be like. Um, and, you know, th this wasn't just people from this church, this was people from other, other Baptist churches. It wasn't even that, it was people from all, the whole body of Christ, you know, gathered in, in one place. And, yeah, it was a really um, powerful, I guess, picture of uh, the, the hope and the glory we have to look forward to in the future. Um, and I was really um, moved by... I guess the the time we had together and I think we ended up me and a couple of other guys we were praying and, and talking till right till the end everyone else had gone and um, yeah so much so most of the hard work packing up had been done so thanks Matt but uh, we um, yeah it was just an uh, incredible opportunity and I felt like, I felt like uh, God ministered to me personally and then um, was helping me through what I was dealing with uh, but also allowing me to minister to, to other people who I'd only just met, but um, he was able to use my words to help, help those people where they were at. So, yeah, I really encourage you, if you have the opportunity, to come to the next one because, um, yeah, the Lord's doing mighty things. Yeah, I'm not sure how much more I can add to that. One of the blessings of last night was watching Michael in prayer uh, with a couple other guys that I knew that he did. You didn't know those guys at all, did you? That was the first time you met. And uh, they're just so deep in places of prayer for each other. Uh, you just do it all just again for that moment in time. And that was just one of many. You know, at one point we did, um, you ever played musical chairs? 
Uh, we did musical prayer last night. Now that just puts everyone out of their comfort zone, right? Right there. Fortunately, I was playing the guitar, so it was all good. But, um, so what, what, what one of the guys said is, we're just gonna, Matt's going to play, and we're just going to start moving around the hall. As soon as he stops, whoever you stop with, that's who you're going to be praying for. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. That's just not Baptist at all, right? And, uh, and uh, anyway, everyone did it, it seemed, as what you were watching. And you got over, I think there was close to 150 people there last night all up, and just moving around and around. And as soon as I stopped the music, did the whole room just erupted into prayer. It was just amazing. And, and then I, like I, after about 10 minutes, they're still praying, and I started playing, and they're still praying, and still praying and praying, until finally one guy comes up and says, okay, we're going to just wind this up. But you could see that people just wanted to pray. And, and like, I'm not suggesting we do musical prayer this morning. Maybe tonight. Who's coming out tonight? <laughs> I'm doing prayer by myself, right? I'll just wander around with my guitar. And when I stop, I'll pray for myself. Yeah. So, um, but it was just, I don't know, there's a fun inside of this whole place as well. And the Holy Spirit is just brilliant on so many levels. And, and fun is one of those. Uh, and like even sitting there playing my guitar, a guy just walks up behind me and just says, can I pray for you? And he puts his hand on my chest and, and just starts praying his heart out and just believing God's got a word for me. And just to speak it over me. Just to have the comfort and the freedom, it's, it's hard to exp express it just the way that it feels because it's more than just a feeling. You're actually engaging with the Spirit of God. It's, it's quite brilliant. We're going to let the kids go down to Kids Church. So thank you, Lorraine. You're awesome and unreal. Yeah, receive that and accept that. I'm going to spend some time in prayer and then Pam's going to come up and read to us. So if you'd just like to pray. So here's one of the things that happened last night. There was a, a couple who turned up before the service and they said to one of the other guys who was leading, uh, so we're really feeling quite sad tonight and a friend of ours is quite sick. They were coming tonight and rang us up and said they couldn't make it and just wondered if we could just pray for our friend who was sick. And so my friend took this couple aside and they just started praying and, and praying. At 7 o'clock, uh, this person turns up and sits in the back corner next to my friend. And they said, and my friend goes, um, how you going? I'm Steve. Introduce themselves. And the friend goes, I was sick this afternoon, but all of a sudden I felt better. So I decided to come. All right? Is that random? Is it random that that person sat beside the guy who prayed? Do you see how God works beyond our expectations at times? So let's just pray. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for all that you did last night. And I just want to believe and know that everything that happened last night was generations in the making and will be generations still being made for the things that you spoke and did and lives that were changed and healed and restored and lives that were just laid open for scary moments just to step out beyond where you've ever been before for all of those things, Father, I know that many people embrace those things. And so, Father, I thank you for that opportunity to engage at the moment where we, as a church, could open the doors here and just allow our ministry to happen at a level that's just extraordinary. And so, Father, we just, as this little church in Haberfield in the middle of Sydney, uh, we just have such a, he a heart to see the Spirit of God to flow out through these doors and, and impact communities impact our city, impact our neighbourhoods and our families and our friends in a way that sees the love of Jesus flow. And Father, we just again, as a church, we just lift up to, those, to you those who are not well and just conscious again that even in our own church, there are just so many that are just crying out to you for places of healing and restoration. And, and Father, this morning, I just pray that you might place a name on each of our hearts just to lift up to you this morning, right in this moment, and say, Father, would they receive a touch of your healing power today? Then, Father, I pray that you give us a name of another person who's not inside this church that also needs a touch of your healing power, or just even a touch of your love. 
Father, that this day these names will be lifted up into the heavens knowing that you answer prayer. And so, Lord, our hearts are turned to the Word of God and we just love the Word of God. Just love everything about it. Love the way that it speaks to us, challenges us, convicts us, disciplines us at times, builds us up, exhorts us. Like there's just so many just applications from the Word. And I pray that whatever you have in store this morning, that is what will occur. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Luke chapter 8. Thank you, Pam. It was a great meeting last night. Luke chapter 8. Starting at verse 4. As a large crowd gathered and people were flocking to him from every town, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed. <clears throat> so as he was sowing, some fell on the path. It was trampled on and the birds of the sky ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocks where it sprang up. It withered since, lack, since it lacked moisture. Other seed se fell amongst the thorns. The thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Still other seed fell on the good ground. When it sprang up, it produced a crop a hundred times what was sown. He said this, and he called out, Anyone who has ears to hear should listen. Hmm. Yeah, anyone who has ears to hear. Got any of those here this morning? Is to hear, we should listen. So this parable, I was actually going to do this one in Bible study, but it, the Lord just lays a really clear revelation on me with this one. So I thought, you know what, I want to bring this one to church. So I apologise to my Thursday evening Bible study group. You were going to get this one, but um, I decided to use it this morning instead. This parable is well known, is it not? Thank you, Lily. Is it too well known? Is that, am I going to be repeating what you already know? Like, it hasn't changed in 2,000 years. I'm not going to change it now. I think the way the Lord said it's pretty good. I'll give it a 10 out of 10. How about, how about you guys? You give it a 10 out of 10? What I love about this story, like if you ever want to do a Bible study the way that Jesus does Bible study, it's quite extraordinary. Because Jesus gathers the crowds together, and again, so in the Bible, when a crowd gathers, it's not just disciples, all kinds of people. You got that? Every single time you read that a crowd has gathered, you've got people who love Jesus, you've got people who hate Jesus, you've got people who are cynical about Jesus, you've got people who want to be healed, you've got people who want to be set free from demonic spirits. All those kinds of people create the crowd. Okay? And I reckon that's an unusual place. Like last night we had over 100 people downstairs that were just there to engage with God. And that's just amazing. That's just, I just love doing that sort of stuff. I'll do it and do it and do it and do it. Uh, but when Jesus is walking the land, it's all kinds of people. And, and Jesus goes, oh, I've got a story for you. Now when Jesus tells you he's got a story, you think this is, we're about to do Bible study, right? Is that right? We're about to do Bible study. When Jesus says, I've got a story, you sit down and, and Jesus just lets rip the story just exactly as Pam read it out. That's the story from start to finish. That, that, that's the story. So he said, there's this guy, he's, got, he's a farmer and we get that from there and, and he's got some seed and he sows some and it lands on hard ground, the birds take it. There's some seed that lands on shallow ground and it just shoots up very quickly uh, but then the sun hits it and it withers and it dies. Some seed's thrown in to uh, the thorn, where there's going to be thorns and, and weeds and, and they grow up together and the thorn and the weed chokes out the... the, the, the are you with me? And then finally, some seed gets sown in good soil and it produces an enormous harvest. And Jesus just finishes. You know when someone tells you a story and you're not sure whether they finished the story or not? 
And so you sit there and you wait for it, and you go, oh, that was a story? It kind of deflates the person who's telling the story, doesn't it? Because you're actually looking for, a, okay, there's a purpose, there's a reason, there's, there's something. And there, but there's Jesus. I've got a story and just gives it. There's no Bible verses. There's no references back to Moses. There wasn't anything about the Ten Commandments. Nothing about the prophet Daniel. Just a story that Jesus gives. And it's like this awkward silence that the disciples go, well, what does that mean? You ever said that to Jesus? What does that, what does that mean? That's just a random story, Jesus. Well, that's a story that we see every day. They were rural people. And he's out there walking about with the crowds and there's, there's farms all around it. And maybe Jesus just got the point of interest that he'd like to be a farmer one day. And he goes, well, this is how it kind of works for me. Is that the story? And so I'm reading this parable, and I've, I've read this parable many times. And when I went to do this one with our Bible study group, I've done it so many times, I thought, you know, I'm going to skip over this one. You know when you do that, the Lord just has this way of just pulling you back to this one and say, stop being so arrogant. Is that right? You've, you've been there, haven't you, De Debbie? Like, it's just that. It's just the Lord just brings you back and says, I've got something to say to you. And if you're not going to listen to it the first time, you will listen to it the second time. But I'm actually going to get my point across. And there's Jesus. And he's there with the disciples. And the disciples say, Jesus, can you just explain that to us? And so with the whole crowd, his own disciples and followers have said, I don't understand. You need to explain that to me because I'm not picking up uh, just how that connects in with what your story is all about. And Jesus says this cracking statement just after. Uh, he says that anyone who has ears to hear, people, the disciples asked him about this parable, and, and Jesus replies this, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God. But I use such parables to teach the others so that scripture might be fulfilled. When they look, they won't really see. When they hear, they won't really understand. And you go, Jesus, what's that all about? Does that mean you're just saying stuff cryptic? Does anyone like cryptic crosswords? I hate them. I hate cryptic crosswords. It's just like, oh, you just got to be thinking so deeply on those places. You've got to, and it's deeper than I can think, right? I'm just giving you an understanding of where I, I exist. I can do the telegraph crosswords, can't do the herald ones probably says something about my intellect, right? Is anyone nodding right now? Anyway, and so here is Jesus and he says to them, you are permitted but some are not understanding what I'm saying and it's right there that the light came on for me. So here's the thing, if you want to understand me, you've got to know me. Is that right? There are people in scripture that thought they knew Jesus and they came up with this. Now, you're the prince of demons. That's what they came out with. Another one said, oh, well, well, Jesus himself said, you, some people have called me, I'm a glutton and a drunkard. Anyone seen Jesus like that? Like... But that's what it says. It's recorded there in Scripture. Uh, but what the problem is, is they don't know the one. They've made judgment calls upon what they think based upon some level of behaviour that they may have seen or maybe just gossip or rumour. Does that make sense? And until we take the time to understand the one who is giving the message, then all of a sudden the message can take on a completely different meaning. And, and so in that little moment, it's just like... The disciples were permitted to understand because they are the ones who believed. And when I say believed, they are the ones who are following and becoming like him. If you're a follower or a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're actually called a disciple of Christ. But as we've said in the last few months, if that is you, you are becoming like Christ. You are permitted to understand because of your faith. Not because you're any better or worse than anybody else, but because you've engaged with this place called faith and all of a sudden righteousness and God's presence have come in a way that all of a sudden some of this stuff is starting to make sense. But to the disciples, it, it, did, it did not. 
And, and so here are the disciples, and they've heard what Jesus has got to say. Now, sometimes when people say random stuff to you, you just go, oh, okay, cool. So what are you doing tomorrow? Is that right? Who does that? Like when someone says something really random to you, and, and you just don't know what to do with that sort of stuff, so you just go to some small talk place and, and go, okay, I don't really understand what you're on about there right now, and that's just a really, really cryptic kind of parable that you're actually giving to me, so let's just talk about something else. Maybe I'm the only one who does that. But there are the disciples, and they've just gone, well, we just actually love this guy that much, and we just know this guy that much, that whatever he's got to say, if I don't understand it, there's something in it I need to hear. And I, I just think that that is just such a stance for us as believers to be in because there's so much that occurs in our world that we just don't understand. And, and so often we just go, well, that's just life or it's say la vie or whatever that is in Latin or French. Thank you. Just showing you my ignorance once again. <laughs> but there's the disciples and they sit with Jesus and they don't care who's listening. And they said, Jesus, I don't understand that. So here are a bunch of guys and a bunch of women with them uh, that engage with a moment of faith. They engage with a moment that's now years in the making because Jesus is doing his thing. And, but Jesus just didn't appear at the age of 30. He, he lived all those 30 years before he got to the age of 30 and before he started pushing further and further into ministry. And it's not as if you get to a certain age and all of a sudden your character changes. You become who you are from the days that you are born on this earth and all of a sudden Jesus at the age of 30 starts be walking into these days that they call his ministry days and there the disciples are following him and they know this guy's character. They know that what he's about to say has got something they need to learn from because they believe that he is the Son of God. They believe that he is the one sent from heaven. They, are, they believe that God so loved the world that he sent Christ to save us, not to condemn us. And so if you start reading the scripture, knowing who Jesus is, before you know it, it starts taking on new meaning and new understanding. And, and there's Jesus with the crowd and he's trying to show to them just a working understanding of what happens when faith goes out. And, and so he goes, I've got this, this, this uh, farm owner who's got a whole bunch of seed and he's just going to sow some seed. That's just common sense stuff. But some of it falls on hard ground. Okay? And the Bible says the birds come and pick it up and take it off, take it away. Now, often in Christian circles, we just go, well, they're the ones who are never going to believe anyway. But you know what? Here's a point of revelation to you. How many times has the Lord sown seed in your life that Satan has stolen away? How many times? Once? Well, let's just multiply that by many, many more times, and, and you'll find that the Father has been doing things in your world, in your life, longer than you can imagine, but, and so often it just falls on hard ground and then just disappears. One of the things I loved about Spirit and Grace, I've been doing this for a few years, and when the idea came to bring this to the local church, I wanted it. I desired for it. Three years before I went to Spirit and Grace retreat, so I've done four of them, I was invited to go and I kept saying no. Seed, hard ground, disappears. I'm out of the picture for those three years from this kind of understanding and this kind of concept. And before you know it, I'm realising how much at times the seed has been there, but my heart's been hard. And, and so then I thought about that through Christ's eyes, and he hasn't stopped sowing seed, so praise be to him, right? Praise be to him that he has not stopped sowing seed. But then there's some seed that falls on shallow ground, and we praise Jesus when we see a little bit of life. And so the Bible says, for those who have heard and, and, and they've believed, and this little shoot has come up, and I don't know about you, but when I plant something, which is very, very rarely, but when I see some level of growth, I'm just high-fiving everybody because it actually works. Right? Unless it's a Mariah Bush, I can't stand them because you always got to be trimming them back. I don't know how I keep those things working, but they continue to work, right? But, you know, but here's the thing, when we see a little bit of life, we want to jump on board and go, yes, it's worked, it's here. But the Bible says the sun is beaten down upon it, which means the effects of the circumstances around us has gotten so uncomfortable before you know it. Life has shriveled and it's like it was never there before. There's a memory that something grew, but there's nothing to show for it. 
And then again I sat there in my own mind, in my own moment, and I wondered how many times the Lord has sown a seed only for it to disappear because I've allowed the circumstances of my life to steal from what God has placed. And once again it becomes a hard heart. Anyone been there? Yep. There's times when you go to like a spirit and grace or a conference or a retreat, you could be high-fiving everybody, man. You could be high-fiving people when you go back to work and they don't even know why you're so happy. But a week later, if it's not been sown into the good soil and the circumstances hit it, before you know it, it withers. And it's just a memory. And Jesus says, but there's some seed that's sown amongst thorns. Now, no farmer plans to, to sow stuff amongst thorns, right? And every farmer I know, even the good soil, you've got to get rid of the weeds, don't you? Like, it's hard to grow anything except for weeds. I just wish, like, apples grew like weeds, or olives grew like weeds. I've got an olive tree that's been now six years in the making. I haven't got one olive. Still. And I think I told you guys about the olive tree I planted back in Cheltenham Road. I grew that for about five years. I've got one olive. One. And I took that and I put it in some salt because that's what I was told to do. And I left it there for a few weeks and I took a bite of that sucker and oh my gosh. It wasn't good. It was not good. But weeds, man, they just grow. I just wish you grew fruit like you grow weeds. But so Jesus goes, some has been sown amongst the weeds and, and what happens is that it grows and you go and praise Jesus like you're actually seeing something. You're actually seeing it come to nearly to a place of fruit but we allow the effects of this world to choke us and before you know it, nothing comes from that and all we get is a whole bunch of weeds and a whole bunch of, of weed and it just doesn't look right. Who's going to go through that sort of stuff and does that even look attractive? And before you know it, life starts disappearing again. But it's been sown in some good places because we've seen some good growth. Is that not like our world that we live in? And like in reflecting on how many times seed has been sown onto hard places or into shallow places or into thorny places, at this deep moment of conviction. And the question that I ask the Lord, well, what's it look like for good soil? What is that? What is good soil? And so for me, not being a farmer by any stretch of the imagination, you see on TV, good soil looks that big, rich, dark, and you see it, right? You see it on TV and you see it on the documentaries, but what you don't see is the months of preparation that brought it to that place. You don't see a guy who's stressing over it or praying over it. You don't see what he does to sow into that. You don't see what he has to do to get rid of all the wheat. You don't see any of that. You just see the field and you go, that's good soil. That's what I want to be sown into. Father, just sow me straight there. I don't want anything else. I just want to be sown into the good soil. And the father said to me, when I'm looking at this, he goes, you don't understand what good soil is then, Matt. I want to share with you a story. So last night uh, we sang a song. It's, it was a, a reprise of a, an old hymn. Uh, and I know we did something similar to it last Sunday, which is why we didn't put the song in this service this Sunday, because I just don't do stuff that regularly. But it's called It Is Well With My Soul. Does anyone know the old hymn? Does anyone know who wrote the old hymn? His name is Horatio. Yeah, okay, like anyone got any Horatios here? It's, it's one of those old timer names that, that nobody really goes for. Horatio Spafford. He wrote this song, and, and in, when I was uh, speaking into this song last night, I was talking about the guy who wrote it, and I said I didn't know him, but I wondered. I wondered what the guy's story was. And I wondered if he wrote it from a, just a place of high five and everyone, or he wrote it from a place of, uh, wow, life is just really hard. And a girl came up to me after the service and she says, can I just have a word with you? And she goes, have you ever heard of Horatio Spafford? And I said, no, I haven't. And she said, well, have a look, Google him, listen to his story. So if you don't know Horatio's story, let me just tell you what, where and how this song, this song was written and, and see if you can connect it as well with my soul with this. And if you can find that, you'll find what good soil actually looks like. So Horatio Spafford lived in the eight, late 1800s. And in 1871, the great fire of Chicago went through Chicago. And this was a guy who had many properties and a whole lot of money and a, and a big family. Had four daughters and married. And when the, when the, the fire went through, it bankrupted him. He lost it. He started again. 
Uh, he was a lawyer and he started again. He started building it up and two years later uh, he had enough to take his family uh, by, by boat to, to Europe. That's cool. Uh, but anyway, what happened is, is that before that he got on the boat, uh, that, that, that Chicago and America went through a recession and he couldn't afford his ticket. And so he sent his wife and his four daughters on this boat all the way over to Europe. While they were there, while they were going to Europe, the boat hit another boat and it sank. All four daughters died. His wife lived and the only word he got about it, which was weeks later, was a message from her via telegram which says, saved alone. So Horatio uh, gets on a boat. But somewhere between America and Europe, where he thinks that the ship sunk, he started singing this song. It's where it came from. It is well with my soul. So what happened is Horatio, he, he has three more kids, right? And, and the oldest boy, uh, they have a boy next, so he, he had four girls, had a boy and then two girls. The bo young boy died of scarlet fever at the age of four, right? The church he's attending then declared over his life that because of his suffering, it's God's divine punishment. I'm reading this at my desk crying this morning. And this guy's singing, it is well with my soul. His song is his, his anthem of faith. That whatever God is doing right now, I don't understand it. But in faith, I'm actually going to start taking back some of these things. And, and so here's, here's how this guy wound up. So after he was declared over him, that his church declared that this was evidence of God's divine punishment over his life. I can't even get my brain around that, that phrase. But here, in response, the Spaffords formed their own messianic sect called the Overcomers. Uh, and in 1981, the Spaffords, including baby Bertha and newborn Grace, set sail for, for Ottoman Turkish Palestine. The Spaffords settled in Jerusalem and helped a, found a group called American Colony. Colony members later joined Swedish Christians engaged in a philanthropic work among the people of Jerusalem regardless of their religious aff affiliation and without proselytizing motives, thereby gaining the trust of local Muslim, Jewish and Christian communities. And during and immediately after World War I, the American colony played a critical role in supporting these communities through the great suffering and deprivations by running soup kitchens, hospitals, orphanages and other charitable ventures. You want to know what good soil is? It's that. Good soil is wherever God you are, God is, and understanding what that means. Now, I pray that none of us ever have to go through what the Spaffords had to go through, but, but here was a challenge on my soul that I've got to stop thinking that the circumstances around me have got to define what is good soil. I've got to find the Father wherever I am because I know that he's here to be found. I know that at times I've allowed things to be landed on hard ground and it's been picked and taken away. I know I've high five the Lord at times when they send a little bit of life and he's going, man, it's got to go into better ground than that. And this is just not deep enough. I know there have been times where I've let the things of this world choke out the things of the Spirit. And all of these things the Father is calling me to see that good soil is wherever you are and God is along for the ride. It is in those places that we start declaring it is well. Such an interesting part for me last night is in leading it. You get lots of people who want to engage with these moments after and they want to come and talk to you and they want to come and speak and you hear in each one of their walks the turmoil of the week they have just gone through and, and the phrase, it is well, is something that they want to grow into and before you know it, they want to walk out of this place declaring it is well even before they see that it is. Is that not faith? Is that not faith? So if the Spaffers got all so, all so upset and decided, you know what, we're just going to move to the furthest corner of the world and just do life the way that we ever want to just do it without anybody else, never would have heard it from them again. But there are the Spaffers who've got a faith in the Father in heaven and regardless of what people have said about them, regardless of even their own circumstance, they discover what they're on the planet to do and they just go and do it. 
This thing called the American Colony got a Nobel Peace Prize a number of years later. Do you reckon he set out to say, I'm going to just get a Nobel Peace Prize? Do you think he just did that? Probably what he went through, he didn't want to be noticed by anybody else, and he just started serving people just wherever he was. And before you know it, the God starts doing stuff when we just find our place on the planet and just work on that. Good soil is wherever you are, God is there, and you allow the Father to get rid of the weeds, to make the ground go deeper, and the hardness of heart starts disappearing. Has anyone found that? Because there's so many times, and like even as when you go to Sunday school and you hear these stories, you have it in your brain the way that they are supposed to be, don't you? The way that it's just been told. The way that you see the pictures, like I used to have a picture Bible. Anyone have a picture Bible? Yeah, everyone had a picture Bible, right? Uh, you got a picture Bible? Awesome, isn't it great? I, I just love pictures. Like I'm a very visual sort of guy, and so the stories tell a, a thousand words, and I'm very happy with that. I wish they had done that for the HSC. I would have coped. But the problem is with some of the things of the picture Bible, if that's the way we only see it, then often we miss what it is for good soil to occur. And so here's the thing. The, the good soil, the Bible says, for those who hear, believe, and then fruit comes from that. We're not responsible for the fruit. That's the Father in heaven. Okay? We're just responsible to do the planting. Okay? I can't make olives come from my tree. I actually haven't laid hands on it yet in prayer. Maybe I should try that. I can't make fruit happen, right? That's the Father's job, and that's his problem. That's not mine. What my part in this is to allow to, the understanding for myself and for, even for us here to know that wherever I am, the Father in heaven is doing something. And this is where good soil is. So if you're sitting here this morning going, well, I, I just don't have good soil or I'm not in the good soil, that's Satan lying to you right there. Whatever your circumstances, that's the good soil. Whatever you find yourself, that's the good soil. Regardless of what people or even a church wants to say over you, that is where the good soil is to be found. The Father in heaven is the farmer. He is the one who leads. He is the one who go grows. He is the one who brings this to fulfillment. He's just calling for us to be in faith. Yeah? We okay with that? So at the end of this parable, Jesus says... Uh, the seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as been planted. Now, as not being a farmer, we just go, amen, praise God, that's awesome. But a farmer goes, that's what I expect. If I'm going to plant, I want to harvest. I'm not going to plant one apple seed and hope I get one apple. I'm going to plant an apple seed and hope I get a whole thousand or thousands of apples over many years because of the seed that I have planted. And, and here's Jesus saying it works exactly the same. If God places that seed of faith in you, expect a harvest. Don't expect just one. It, but here's the thing. Expect a harvest that's understood and tangible. And so we're not just talking about this ethereal thing where we, God's just going to bless us beyond our imagination. It's a harvest where it's actually seen, felt and experienced. I trust last night for those who are here, there was a moment where a harvest was actually touched, felt and experienced and engaged with. What I loved about last night is when you have all people who come together and you don't know where they've come from. I love it. I had a bunch of people from SMBC. Wasn't that great, Kayla? To see all those people from SMBC. That's my college as well. Uh, so it's a Bible college just over at Croydon. And I was just so encouraged to see so many of them come. Uh, and of course, it's traditionally quite a conservative college. And, and there, well, two of them were praying with Michael, right? And it didn't look like they were being very conservative when they were praying for you, brother. Uh, they looked like that they were just engaging power of the Holy Spirit. And there's the harvest starting to become tangible. Could you possibly imagine what was going to happen when you walked into that room? Could you have known that by the time you walked out of there, two random guys were just going to come and place their hands on you and start praying and you were going to do the same. Could we even get that into our brains? But there is the Father doing what the seed was always planned to do and here a whole bunch of people are going, I'm up for that. I'm just up for that. Musical prayer? Well, that just sounds ridiculous, but actually it worked. Did it not work, Debbie? Did you not see that it worked? And it's just like all of a sudden God starts doing stuff with the seed that he has sown and all he's asking is for us to engage in a place of faith. That is what is good soil. And before you know it, the Father's doing 
what only the Father can do. And when Jesus tells you a story, ask him for the answer. Ask him for the understanding. When Jesus has got you walking through the time that you have, engage with the process of understanding what he is doing. You ready to pray? Father in heaven, we just thank you for this time this morning and we thank you, Lord, for the power of your word. We thank you for parables and I just know that inside of this room uh, there are many parables that are just going through people's minds. And that's a parable of their own life. And Father, it's just there's so many things that just occur that can point us and lead us to you. We just pray that this morning that each of us will come to the realisation that the good soil is right here. The good soil surrounds them and the seed has been sown. So Father, today let faith rise. And we leave the fruit up to you. But Lord, we are here as a part of the harvest, desiring to see you at work within us. In Jesus' name, amen.